we are doing town halls uh, in, in all of our districts to just kind of be available to answer questions or to fill you in on what happened during the legislation. Um, so that's what we're here for. Um, we've done, I've done a few of these already and we've done them um, very informally. Some of them we give a rundown of the kind of most, uh, if you will, egregious bills that we, we thought were egregious and difficult and then um, we've allowed people to ask questions. But it's, it's kind of up to you. If you want to open with questions, we can start with that. Um, I'll let Brian introduce himself too because this is his first year and maybe he'll give you some information about being a freshman is what we call him. So. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, she hasn't pushed me in a locker yet, so. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I know most of you, uh, I'm, uh, some of you as I just met uh, in the last couple of minutes, but uh, Brian Lanou, I'm the uh, state representative for the 45th district, and I have uh, five uh, great towns, uh, uh, Griswold, Sterling, Voluntown. I have Southern Plainfield here, uh, which uh, consists of uh, uh, essentially a Route 12 corridor. Uh, I have the flats, the Upper Village, the Lower Village, and it's been a great experience representing Voluntown and all the towns are like, and you have, have part of uh, Lisbon uh, along the Route 12 corridor as well. So it's, uh, it's been a, a great experience. I love serving the people. Uh, I love uh, trying to advocate for the district uh, in Hoffer. I don't always like the product that's coming out of Hoffer. Uh, I think this, I think Ian would agree, this session was particularly uh, uh, trying and um, disheartening with some of the, uh, uh, a lot of the bills that were coming out. Uh, particularly in our budget, I think it was very um, anti-business. Uh, a, a lot of our businesses of all sizes, small to the biggest corporations, I don't think are clear where the state wants to head. And uh, when that's the case, they can't plan their affairs accordingly. And uh, th that's what, uh, uh, unfortunately, dwarfs uh, job growth and expanding uh, expanding jobs has been a uh, there's going to be a $50 million tax increase on businesses over the, this uh, budget, uh, $1.7 billion in tax increases overall, and that's money that sucked right out of the economy, just like a vacuum, uh, money they're not going to be able to spend to hire uh, new people, uh, money that uh, they're not going to be able to uh, use uh, uh, to uh, buy other products that a business requires, so that supply chain. Uh, really gets cut off at that point. And um, you have the uh, $15 minimum wage that's going to also have a dampening effect in uh, uh, paid uh, family leave. We had some, we had an alternative to that, particularly that came out of the Conservative Caucus. We can get into that in, as well. So uh, those are a lot of the concerns I had. Um, Representative Dubitsky at the uh, Wyndham County uh, Chamber of Commerce, I think he said it right about the state budget. The only thing he liked about it was it was on time. Uh, <laughs> and I think, uh, I, think uh, I speak for Ian on that one. I think we both agree with that statement. I think that was a, that's a solid assessment. Um, there, there was some uh, good things. Um, uh, a couple of positive uh, uh, bills was the uh, opening the uh, hemp market, the cultivation of hemp. Um, it's a billion dollar uh, industry, and I think that that's going to uh, uh, create some opportunity for our farmers to hopefully um, offset some of the uh, lost income that they've experienced throughout the years, um, particularly in the dairy industry and some other uh, uh, agricultural industries. So that's a that's a um, cautiously optimistic with hemp. However, cautionary tale is if it's a billion dollar industry, you got to make sure suddenly they're not going to be cultivating two billion dollars of hemp that's going to flood the market and drive the price uh, way down similar to what we experienced in the dairy market. So that's that's uh, a few things in the uh, in a nutshell. Um, and uh, again, we'll, uh, I think we'll, do, oh, also one other thing that's very important that I really, particularly for uh, Plainfield, is there's, uh, there's a, uh, a new pilot, that's gonna be a new pilot program for, to get uh, high school kids uh, certified in advanced manufacturing, um, the, the manufacturing of the future, uh, future technologies. I'm on the Commerce Committee and want to continue to encourage and push that. Uh, EWIB, uh, the uh, Eastern Workforce Investment Board, has done great work um, trying to uh, encourage certification uh, to make sure that the, the certification and the education matches what the jobs are going to be for the future. So I want to make sure we have that for uh, the people of Plainfield and uh, throughout the district and the state. 50% uh, of the new jobs uh, came out of Eastern Connecticut, which comprises 20% of the population. So it shows certain things are, are working. 
uh, but we have to uh, we have to accelerate that and get ahead of the game very quickly. So uh, I'll stop talking and um, I will uh, op we'll open it up to you guys. Uh, we'll kind of let you guys uh, stir the conversation here. So basically, on the, the program you just mentioned, how is that going to be rolled out? Um, it's going to be. Uh, I think they're going to they're going to pick. I think uh, they're going to pick a couple of high schools across the state, and um, it's going to be with uh, funds that are already available, and they're going to essentially uh, 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 certify a lot of uh, these kids with a new program, like with the, uh, the new type of uh, manufacturing manufacturing of the future. Right. Not necessarily an ar archaic. Uh, so it's going to be a, as as uh, a, speci uh, a specific class uh, type situation, or just that if they meet these guidelines or standards. I think you're gonna be. I think they're gonna look for like a host school. But I can get you more information on that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're gonna look for like a host school and have uh, most of that be like the hub where they could set up the machinery and whatnot. And, and so what's bring the, the, what's the timeline? I think they're. I think they're, I believe they're looking at that. I think they have to. I think it's gonna be. Uh, they're gonna look. They're gonna research it uh, this year. I think they have to report back by January. But I'll have to double check that for you. Okay. Let me. Excellent. Let me get that yeah, for you. Yeah. Do we with the polls? No, we just started. Okay. Did you, Kevin, did you want to ask a question? I have a couple questions. One is, uh, where do we stand on getting transfer, uh, transportation money for what we were looking to do from NECOC? Are we still in limbo? Is there been any word on it whatsoever? So we just had a meeting this week, and I think, I don't know, maybe Brian could, I know you weren't there. I don't know if you couldn't come or what, but um, Heather and I met with um, SEAT, which is the Southern uh, Transportation, NECOC, which is the Northern, we met with um, the first electman, Kathy Tendrich, and we met with um, DOT. And we had a, a at length conversation about where we were at. We were trying to catch them up because there's new staff now for DOT. There's a new commissioner. The new commissioner's uh, expertise is in rail. So they weren't sure you know, where he was at with some of this stuff, but we were trying to catch them up. We've been waiting since February. In February, they didn't, have, they didn't even have a new commissioner assigned. And we've been waiting since then to get an appointment. But we finally did. And they're, su they're supposed to get back with us in about 30 days. We do have another appointment scheduled in July. Um, hopefully, we'll have something to talk about then. But we set up another appointment so that we could keep this moving along. They didn't seem to think it was a problem. I think uh, the issue is going to be more about how robust it's going to be and then how much Plainfield's going to want to put into it. So what we were currently talking about is Plainfield's contribution being 33000 The state would be 66, and then the federal government pays for half, half the program, which is another ninety nine. So you're talking about spending about $200,000 here in Plainfield for the transportation um, uh, implementation of a program here. What that buys us, we don't know. And how that will look, we don't know. So that is why we're waiting for the Southeast Transit to kind of fill us in, because there would be some meetup with the North and the South, and how that would look like in terms of runs and that sort of thing. So yes, we're meeting. We have another appointment. I'm hoping that that moves along. And um, I insisted on another appointment before we left the other day, and I will continue to do that. So we don't sit here waiting for a year again without that. So. That's kind of where we're at. And you might be sitting anyway because uh, Plainfield only allocated 12500 versus 33 Well, Kathy was there, and she did say that they, because the uh, I think the first amount she allocated was for a, a prorated portion of the year, but she said that they had money in the budget for, she said, between thirty and 33000 That's what she said at the meeting. So if that is the case, then, then we're looking at a $200,000 total budget in this area for transportation, okay. if everything else goes. Uh, another question is, um, I see here on page 19, it talks about the business taxes and fees, and all we've heard about this entire session was taxing on this and taxing on that and tolls. And was there any discussion of actually cutting positions or merging positions together versus just taxes? So we did a lot of that last session, as you know, we took out deputy commissioners and we did a lot of that kind of uh, cut back. I was not in any, I'm on appropriations and I heard nothing, nothing about any cutting, nothing. To my knowledge, there's been no cutting. So we have an increased budget of almost $2 billion this year. And then an, another almost one, $1 billion in increased taxes. And um, I think 
uh, Representative Lemieux already talked about what the businesses, what the impact on the businesses is going to be, which is going to be huge. The other thing we're facing, too, is that um, uh, the governor was supposed to have made uh, some, uh, um, some communication and, uh, and some deals with uh, state employees in terms of cutbacks for $450 million, and that hasn't happened yet. So to our knowledge, that could be, be our shortfall already running out of the gate on this, on this budget. Yeah, and I, I know we had, we had suggested as a caucus on the Republican side uh, for a lot of the state uh, pos uh, uh, positions. Uh, as people retire on uh, different uh, positions, they can, th uh, they can vacate them through attrition. Uh, we've talked about privatizing, for example, the DMV. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, uh, I took a day, before I was a rep uh, a couple of years ago, I took a day off from work because uh, I had to get my license renewed. And a co-worker said, well, why don't you go to AAA and be in and out of there in uh, 10 minutes. I, I hadn't even known that that was a possibility. And uh, I went in there, and uh, it was absolutely accurate. I was in and out in uh, uh, 15 minutes. Uh, the license uh, that I ended up getting looks the same. It looks like the real deal. I've had no problems with it. So. Um, like I said, it was in there for a fraction of the time that it would be if it was uh, a DMV. Not to just pick on one department, but that's the type of thing we need to do. With, uh, we had we had mentioned, of course, consolidating services, uh, vacating certain positions through attrition, uh, uh, stop the redundancy, a lot of the back of the house uh, work that needs to be done from department to department. We can uh, we can we can merge that uh, some of that stuff. So, um, we had, we had offered all that and uh, suggested that uh, the Democrats chose not to take any of that up uh, in their um, uh, budget of And a final one, if I could, is just um, if, if the, the one I sent you guys for an email before about it following up on the Constitution question. If you can get back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. Could you remind me on that one more time? I apologize, sir. Yeah. Following up on the Constitution as to who to go to in case you see a violation of the Constitution. Because that's never been explained how that how the process works. State constitution. Thank you. Well, I think I think any of us, if you see a direct uh, a violation, uh, I think I can, I can speak for Heather and Ann, certainly for myself. Feel free to email me. Tell me without. I'll follow it up tonight with another email. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll definitely. Uh, I'll be happy to. Uh, I'll get. I'll make sure you get my email. And, uh, yep, I've already got it. Okay. Yes. I was wondering if you could comment on the governor's efforts. With the um, in regards to the medical, uh, the Medicare savings program going from income based to asset based. To my knowledge, that's not changing. Did you hear that? I'm, I apologize for being late. I'm Heather Summers, and there was terrible traffic on the way here. Um, that has not changed. There is no asset test. So that is a done deal. The, the negotiations are over. Or? Um, the negotiations really never took off. There was just going to be, there was the idea that they were going to cut MSP um, and put an asset test to it along with, um, I shouldn't say cut it, bring it down to the um, standard federal level, which is low compared to what we offer. We offer the federal level plus because the cost of living is so much higher here in Connecticut than it is, let's say, in Kansas. Um, and there was an effort to move forward um, instead of bringing it down to the federal level to look at an asset test so that those who perhaps really shouldn't qualify in some people's opinions would be taken off the list but we would still be able to offer at the higher value because it's so much more expensive. That was the original intent um, but during the negotiations um, which they really aren't negotiations because there's a majority party now that controls everything. It basically was decided they were not going to look at um, changing the MSP. MSP is obviously something that's near and dear to many people's hearts. And um, in MSP, you are allowed to own a home and you're allowed to have a car. And you, have, you are allowed to have, I think it's $7,100 as an individual in savings, that's liquid cash and I think 11,000 as a couple liquid. Um, but there are you know, stories of people having assets in other areas that are not necessarily liquid. So um, that's, that's the law now and that has not changed. So basically it's status quo and the income levels are basically staying yes, the same? Yes, they are. 
it's the federal rate or the average federal plus. Um, so the two air, the two numbers that I just gave you were the the Fed numbers. So Connecticut is above that. Okay. Thank you. If you need the specific um, income levels, I certainly can get that for you. No, I have I have two sisters. One's mm -hmm. a QMB and one's an SLMB. Mm -hmm. And um, they should be good. That program helps them out a lot. It does. I hate to see them lose it. No, that's a, it's a really important program. Um, is It is expensive, but what's the alternative? The alternative is that those folks that are on it would go without their medications. Um, some right. of them would not recover. Um, some of them would choose their medications versus food. And, you know, we, when we look at core government, and I personally, for me, what the role of government is, taking care of those who are so vulnerable is what we should be doing right. rather than doing some of the other things that we're doing. Right. So. That's a program that's near and dear uh, to our heart. And there has been a lot of talk about, you know, potential fraud, but that is so little in that program, I will tell you. Um, it's not, I mean, the people that you meet, I can't speak for you, but they're not sitting on, like, massive 401ks that they're just not using the money for. That's just not happening. Um, more and more, you hear, you see somebody who has, like, $8,000 in uh, liquid cash, and they can't qualify than you do seeing somebody who's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars that they're just stashing away because they don't right. want to pay for their own medication. And, so. and the extra help goes along with that? Sorry? The, the, medic, the uh, prescription part, the extra help from the federal government, that stays in place also? Yes. The LIS, yep. the low-income subsidy? Yes. Okay. Good to hear. Thank you. Yes. yes, sir. Hi, Michael Clark from Plainfield. Hi, Michael. I have always taken an interest in the Connecticut Earned Income Tax Credit, which mm -hmm. was instituted, I believe, in 2011 mm -hmm. by May Flexer uh, as one sponsor uh, on the House side and mm -hmm. Martin Looney, the Senate sponsor. Mm -hmm. The first year was estimated to be going to cost, if for people who don't know, an earned income tax a credit gives a cash back to low-income filers who file a Connecticut income tax. Uh, generally, it involves children. I think a, a filer can get up to $4,000 in cash back uh, after having paid little or not much in, in Connecticut taxes. That is in addition to the federal earned income tax credit uh, for which these people would automatically be available. Uh, the first year it was supposed to cost $98 million. That's money paid out. Uh, I believe it came in at $120 million. I would assume uh, every year since then it's gone up because generally as people become aware of the availability of this uh, benefit, uh, they apply for it. It's also something that's easily uh, abused by people filing false income tax uh, uh, claims, especially on the federal level. But I, I still would like to know, and I don't, how much has been paid out to date. I, I assume it's well over $1 billion since 2011. Uh, I would assume it's probably around $150 million a year. That's in cash paid out to uh, low-income filers by the t uh, state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, this is costing <coughs> a lot of money. And, of course, uh, I've gone around with people on, uh, actually on radio shows with it, uh, uh, when they had Looney and his Republican counterpart uh, on, uh, on public radio uh, uh, in Connecticut once. Uh, it was in 2015, uh, 2015. And uh, also with a uh, financial writer, Kevin Faniff, uh, they seem to be unapologetic about any of this, and uh, there are, I, w I won't go on much longer, but there, are, there have been many puff pieces. Uh, Looney's uh, uh, claim is that it puts money into the Connecticut economy. Uh, obviously, though, the money comes from somewhere. There's no money tree before it is given out to these low-income filers. And anyway, I think this is, uh, now that it's passed, I think, the billion-dollar level, uh, since uh, 2011. I think it's something that needs to be addressed or at least made known. Uh, I would like to know what the uh, yearly and total uh, sum of all these payments has come to. I don't have that answer, but I can get that for you. I know that last, not this term, but last term, during the, when we had a, um, a more equal uh, membership of the legislative uh, House and Senate, there was a uh, push to lower the income level for the earned income credit so that 
um, if you were, you'd have to earn, you couldn't earn as much to qualify for it. They were, they were starting to trim it down. And um, there was, how should I put it, outrage in the yeah, response. Sure. Um, so I, I will have to research that and find out. I just texted someone to see if they can get you that answer. Thank um, you. I just don't have Maybe that right there. Ann has my address, so, and now you have it. Good job. Yeah, that's, you know, I have heard that argument too, that um, there are, you know, low income folks that get this earned income credit in addition to the federal credit that is provided. Most states do not provide this at all. Um, and it, in some cases, the returns are as high as $8,000. So what's happening is that that income is coming from, obviously, um, taxes that are being paid by someone else. Um, and, you know, it's, I don't know what somebody does with it. Maybe they put it into the economy, maybe they don't, you know. I, I, yeah, we don't I, know I can't that. say. Um, but I can certainly get you the numbers. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that's really difficult, as you can all imagine, is um, coming into uh, a system that has been um, providing benefits for so many years. If you are um, coming in sort of in year three and saying, wow, we need to trim this, you can imagine what happens. Um, because people become reliant on the government to help them. Um, and I'm a big advocate of, you know, a hand up rather than necessarily just repeating the same thing to keep somebody in a certain position. So um, it is very difficult to make any changes as slight as they may be. But it would be interesting to take a look at what the um, total income. Yes, has I think we would be. have to start with knowing what has been paid out, and let some people defend it who are in favor of the continued. Uh, 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 increase of the, of the benefit. So does anyone have any specific questions on the budget, on the legislative session? We can talk about some of the, um, what we would consider the positive, the neutral, and, you know, things that we, we would not agree with that have happened. Is it one of the, um, the Steve Martin, thank you. One of the, uh, Items they had brought up was that they added two billion dollars to the budget. Is that correct? In spending. In spending. spending yes, right? that's correct. A billion each year. Right, and um, uh, we have teachers' retirement. Yep. That's going that's to been be... re-amortized and added fifteen billion dollars to your debt. Right. Right, and then. And that's uh, supposed to be a savings program, which I, I don't, I don't, so I don't understand that. Debt savings. Right. <laughs> and then they're, and then the, the ECS. Um, managing, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the, the schools. How are how are they you know, how are they going to work that as that as that rolls out? I mean, last year, you know, was kind of a mess, and, and affected the town you know, pretty greatly here, and a lot of other towns as well. Are you talking about in terms of um, having them pick up some of the tab? Yes. In terms of that, that didn't pass. Okay. That is not in the budget. So um, there is. That doesn't mean it won't be coming back, right? right? I mean, at some point. So I think that in the legislature, the um, the reps and the senators know that their constituents do not want that bill being sent to the town. Um, so whoever's crafting the budget is not going to put that in the budget if they can help it. Um, so, but the teacher's retirement is in um, significant need, to put it that way. Um, at the end of the last session, Connecticut had a billion dollars come in from a windfall tax change at the federal level. Um, and at that point, um, our party said, we have a billion dollars, but it's one time. So let's take $333 million and put it into the teacher's retirement, $333 million and put it into the pension fund, and leave $333 million in the rainy day fund. So we have some, but we're starting mm -hmm. to pay down our debt, and that was rejected. So now when we started the session, there's a billion dollars or $998 million sitting in an account that's all been spent now. So that's what's very frustrating coming in from somebody who's, you know, been a municipal leader, works in your household, you know. So, um, but this year what happened in the budget is the, the same thing that happened with the CVAC agreement. You know, you've paid off your mortgage for 29 years, and then you go out and you refinance it for another 30. 
and you add all this interest payment. So that's what they did with the teacher's retirement. They went out and they re-amateurized it, refinanced it. So they say they're getting a good deal because they know what the payment's going to be consistently, which is great. Um, but it's added $15 billion to the debt for future generations. So um, that's what happened this year. And there's nothing forced down to the towns. I will say every year, you mentioned Senator Looney, he brings that up. He's been wanting to push that to the towns for a long time, and that is a state requirement and a state obligation. So um, that's kind of where we are. So in regard to the Teachers Retirement Board, is there anything that's written that can be changed? Because they pay, the state pays a significant match to the teacher salaries, 30% match to the yeah, I mean, that every year we put a significant amount right. in there, but what has happened is we're playing catch up because for so the many years previous, we didn't. Right. Not we didn't, but right. the previous legislators did not. But there's nothing to change that wording or to go back and revise how much the state is actually. You mean asking the state to put even more in than they're no. now? To reduce that benefit. I know what you want the negotiation. Them to do that? Well, if it's going to fall on the towns, I think it's it's difficult to say that the That's state... That's where it will fall. Right, and the state agreed to pay this amount of money every year. They failed to fund it since 2008, mm -hmm. so now it falls to the towns. It just seems that it's, it's inappropriate to pass that on to towns. I would agree and, with that. Absolutely. And that has not happened yet. Right, it hasn't, but the teachers have picked up one more percent, not a lot, but it, to right. them, it's significant. Right. Um, I will say on the teacher side, um, and I have sisters that are teachers, and my mother-in-law is a teacher. Right. The average contribution nationwide for a teacher to contribute to the retirement is 10%. Yes. State of Connecticut, they were contributing six, and then I think it was 1.25 for health care. Right. Um, last time, because we didn't push it to the towns, they had to contribute another 1%. Right. That's hard to push back on. Absolutely. That is, that's okay with me. Absolutely, you know, because and I agree. if not, we're going to push it to the town. The option was push it to the town. And when you looked at, I don't remember specifically what Plainfield's number was, but I know like the town of Groton um, was close to $6 million. And they were just going to say, okay, we're going to lay off teachers because we don't, you know, we can't come up with that money. Right. So I think that there's a balance. There has been some talk on new teachers coming into the system, mm -hmm. changing the system going forward, which right. we have to have start having those conversations. We do it in all our contract mm -hmm. negotiations. And so Absolutely. perhaps going forward, if they are, I'm just throwing this out there, one of the things that came up, this mm -hmm. is not going to have, I mean, this is not happened, but it has been talked about is if you hire new teachers under, you know, a new um, circumstance, should they be part of a municipal retirement program and then the town can negotiate and decide what they want to do with do going forward should we push our federal delegation to combine with the 13 other states to change the law that Connecticut um, teachers don't have access to Social Security that was a choice they made years ago but many of them are saying why did we make that choice but that can't be changed unless our federal delegation does something about it. There's 13 other states in that same position. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different conversations going on right now, but I think there's a recognition that something has to change because mm -hmm. it's not sustainable. Sure. But the unions are still fighting it with that 1% change. They're still fighting it. They call it a teacher tax. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's either a teacher tax or you can have it pushed to the town, that big 25%, and then you can see what happens. I mean, I have teachers coming to me saying, thank you for doing that, but then the union saying, oh, you put a tax on us. And, exactly. you know, so. Right, right. Um, the town has no power to negotiate. Right. No, so. no, not at all. Well, on the flip side, though, that the state says, well, the town negotiated those senior, those um, teacher contracts. So if Greenwich pays their teachers more, why should the state be responsible for paying more for the Greenwich people and less for the Broughton people or less for the Stonington people? There should be an mm -hmm. average that we're going to pay into, and anything above that, the town should take over. Mm -hmm. So that was an option too, but that's still a really large number for towns to have to absorb with no time to adjust. Right. Right. One last thing. Sure. On that, did the state actually put forth that the money can be transferred from the lottery revenue to pay 
The teachers? No, the teacher yeah, education. To fund, to fund the TRB? Absolutely not. Okay. No. That goes into the general fund like everything else does. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, the, the budgeting is bizarre. I mean, in public health, when, you know, I sit on the chair of public health, if, you, if there's a license fee because Anne's a nurse and she pays her license fee, you would think that that would be applied in the public health budget or pay for what it costs to uh, the, do the paperwork to license the nurse. It doesn't, it goes into the general fund. So you have agencies saying, I don't have any money to license Anne as a nurse. And you're saying, well, but there's money coming in for her license fee, but it doesn't go, it doesn't work that way. So mm -hmm. we were able to stop them from raiding the um, set aside for the parks, the state parks, they wanted to raid that money. Um, your extra ten dollars that you pay for your license, they were going to steal that money and put it someplace else. Yes, Andy. Talk about uh, licensing. How about the professional licenses? Does anybody know that they jacked up the double the fees for the licensing? Professional, like you know, like for electricians, plumbers. Um, I'm not sure if everybody knows that, but we can get a list of all the ones that went up. Yeah. Um, they added some new ones too. What's that? All professional licenses went up. Yeah, I know in Malloy for the only one that didn't go up. The only one that really didn't go up was your because there was outrage was the fishing and hunting licenses. Everything else went up. Some yeah, I know they were doubled. All though. professional licenses yeah. were doubled, like you know the, the electricians, your plumbers, uh, HVAC, or uh, mine doubled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine doubled too. But I don't know if they're going to double. I just want to know if they doubled it again. They added some new folks that are now going to be um, also taxed, right? Good. So I can get you the list. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, um, well, there's $2 billion of new taxes. It's a lot of taxes. It's, um, you know, here and there, everywhere, all the new taxes on, um, you know, if you subscribe to Netflix and you download something, you're going to be taxed on that. There's increases in alcohol tax. Um, there's increases in meals. meal tax. If you, if you, um, you know, you go to any place where your meal is prepared, like if you go to Stop and Shop or wherever and you yeah, buy a pre-cooked chicken, which I have to do all the time because I have no time to cook, you're taxed on that. But if you buy your chicken and it's not cooked, then you're not taxed. Mm -hmm. um, I think they realize that people are so short for time, not many people have time to, you know, cook or make a meal anymore. So um, if you go to a restaurant, you're, there's a new 1% restaurant tax. Um, for going out for dinner, there uh, is tax on interior design. Not that that's something that probably affects most of us, but that that's a new tax. Um, there is these little things like in a car dealer when you trade in your car, the car dealer used to have to pay thirty-five dollars for the pleasure of taking in your used car. That went up to a hundred, like a three hundred percent tax increase for no reason. Um, there's all these little hidden taxes everywhere. So, and the problem is, even with two billion dollars of new taxes, the budget that he just signed quietly is seven hundred million dollars sure. out of whack. Because there's four hundred and fifty million dollars that um, were supposedly savings from union concessions, and you know the union just renegotiated under CBAC. I can't imagine them coming to the table. They hadn't even started the conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, and with hospitals. So that, that savings that is built into the budget does not exist at this time. There's an all, another $50 million that the um, OPM administration is supposed to go find, go find $50 million somewhere. So that is not real at this point. And then we found out that when you build your budget, you're supposed to build it based on the what they call consensus revenue, which is April numbers, what the Office of Fiscal Analysis believes the revenue is going to be for the state of Connecticut. They go through this whole analysis and they say, this is what we think we're going to bring in. But the governor decided to increase that by $180 million, which is against the statute, uh, but he did it anyway, and said he, him and his team think, oh no, we're going to get in $180 million more than the Office of Fiscal Analysis it uh, says we're going to, and we're going to get it through an increase in payroll taxes. Except we lost 1,500 jobs last month, but mm. that's for, for here, there, near there. Um, so you have $180 million that they assume we're going to get above what the accountants and the professional financial people think we're going to get. 
and we're $450 million in, in the savings that's not there, and another 50. So if you add it up, it's close to 700, if not more, million dollars in non-existent savings and revenue that's not there. So this budget is not balanced. It's out of whack before, it, actually before it was signed, and he just signed it yesterday. So yeah, we heard. we're going to be back in for deficit mitigation. Or we'll see a new tax. That's probably when they try to push the tolls then. Tolls do not make financial sense. We can get through yeah. that yeah. again and again. Of course, I know that, yeah. Do you remember that show, what was it, Monty Hall, come on down, let's make a deal? <laughs> That's what it's like. It's like, will you, will you support tools if I do this? You know, behind door number one is this. So um, they just don't make sense. One of the, and you know, we could talk about this for hours, but These one of the Democrats. things that's always left out of the conversation is, you know, they said that the Republican plan, and this is not to be partisan, this is just to show you like the difference in philosophy. One plan has to bond. Well, yes. Tolls, they're still bonding. They leave out the fact that they're bonding. Mm -hmm. You have to bond to put the tolls onto the actual gantries on the road. Um, and they're still relying on bonding. Our plan was we have a $2 billion bonding cap. We were going to use $750 million of that to, to do infrastructure. We took away stuff like the governor's ability to just pass out bonding to whoever he wants. He gets $150 million currently. We took that away. We reduce school construction because most schools have just been redone. We don't need that much in school construction. We reduce the things that weren't necessary and we stayed within the bonding cap. If you put that money set aside for infrastructure plus the gas tax that you get and any um, sales off of new cars, it's plenty. It's exactly what the DOT has asked for for the next 30 years. But their plan is to bond and then bond additional in um, general obligation bonds for gantries and do congestion pricing, which means all of us that have to travel on the roads at the time that is 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. or 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. will pay the most. And the thing about tolls that nobody wants to talk about is, number one, no plan except the one with 82 gantries, which is a toll every four miles, has been even looked at by the federal government. None of his versions that he comes out with on a daily basis have even been looked at. And the federal government could say, absolutely not. The only one they looked at is the one with 82 gantries. So that's a big concern. Um, and they have to approve it with congestion pricing or we have to pay back $6 billion. That's the choice. And tolls just will take about 20 years to even pay for themselves. And if you, I hate that I am a number cruncher because you look at the numbers and you just, it makes your head spin. And if they're not making enough money, what they're going to do is they're just going to raise the rate that you're going to pay per mile. And when they looked at trying to do this, the average cost per mile in the United States is four cents a mile. Connecticut was starting at 10 cents, going to 32 cents. So if you live in Plainfield and you work at EB, you're going to spend about $3,500 a year in tolls just to get to work. So there are other ways to get to the same end point but we have not really been able to have a fruitful conversation that's compromise uh, because there are um, folks that are just sort of set, like it's tolls or no tolls. You know, there, there is an, a possibility, um, and one of the things that we have thrown out in the Senate was, give us the list of the 10 worst bridges in Connecticut. I, what does it cost per bridge? Go down, actually get on a plane and go see Secretary Chow and find out from her what can Connecticut do to fix its bridges. What are our options? No one has done that. There's no freaking plan. It is, it's obscene that they go to the citizens about tolls and stuff when there is not one plan. They do not have a detailed plan. Yeah. So, you know, if you think about it, you would go, you would have a conversation with Secretary Chow, you would go through exactly what Connecticut's options are to fix bridges if that's the most critical thing that we need to do, and come back with what those options are. There are other states that have entered into, like, public-private partnerships on bridges. There are ways to charge a fee to go over the bridge until it's paid, and then you take the fee off. There's all these different options, but we have not even explored that. And that's something that I think we need to do before we ask the citizens of Connecticut to start paying for things that are just another way to steal your money. Can you have the, uh, like, uh, another example of how they operate? 
is the uh, special transportation fund. Uh, like Heather's talking about, we want to spend within our means, we want to uh, spend where, uh, in the places necessary to repair our bridges and our roads. And For example, the uh, STF, um, $170 million over the next two years, the Democrats are clawing out of that and uh, putting it elsewhere into uh, wasteful spending. Not, not, not putting it towards what it's supposed to be going for. Crumbling uh, infrastructure to re, uh, repair our bridges, repair our roads. They're taking and bringing it in and spending it elsewhere. Just think if they suddenly have access to the toll money. Um, you, 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 uh, a leopard don't change your spots. And for 30 years, this is the way they've been doing business. We can't expect them to act any differently with the, uh, the, the, the toll, which is another word for another tax. That's going to be another tax put on the uh, backs of the people of Connecticut. And it will be more of the same. Uh, as, like, as Heather mentioned, what we're talking about as Republicans, prioritize our spending. What, what are we supposed to spend uh, money on? Uh, when I see $100,000 go for a arts festival in Haven, $50,000 for tennis courts, uh, up in uh, South Windsor. That's not the role of government. That's not where we're supposed to be spending money. We're supposed to be spending it on our roads and on our bridges. The Republicans propose, for example, the uh, uh, there's uh, the, uh, the, bu the bus line from New Britain to Hoffer. There are several buses that run during the day and there's nobody on them. Uh, train rides with nobody on them. We're talking about if the, nobody's on them, there's no demand, let's cut those out. Uh, the money that we save from that, let's put that into our bridges. Let's put that into our roads. I mean, it, it incorporates a little bit of common sense. I think that's what we need to, to look at. Uh, I'm not convinced the tolls, adding the toll onto everything else, is going to uh, suddenly make offer change your spending habits. We need that fiscal discipline again, and that's exactly, I think, Laura Devlin and Henry Martin, the ranking members of the Transportation Committee, they did an amazing job traveling the state. They came up to Killing Lake. Uh, they were in uh, Norwich with uh, myself and Dr. Bitsky. I don't know if you haven't done it probably. So they, they've, been, um, they've, been, they've been around the state doing an amazing job, thank you so much, explaining to people uh, exactly what, what the alternative is. And there is alternatives. And I think over the next, uh, over the next uh, 30 years, our transportation uh, needs are going to be, I think it's estimated around $62 billion. Tolls are only going to bring in about uh, $30 billion. So where are we going to get the other uh, 30 uh, uh, so billion dollars from? The Republican plan actually has has a set 65 billion, and that's not with one toll, not putting one toll on the uh, uh, on the backs of the uh, taxpayers of Connecticut. So I think that's what we need to uh, need to look at, and there, there needs to be a whole new way of thinking in Hofford, and I think that's what we're trying to do. Uh, but I, I echo what uh, Heather says that it's very very difficult. It's very uh, to you, know, you come from the real world and you try to figure out Hofford math. You really feel like you're on Hartford. another planet. Um, so okay. Hartford Math. I, I realize I wasn't here the whole time. Um, earlier today, I saw an article online, and I tried to re I tried to reprint it before I came, and I couldn't find it again. Um, but there's a certain amount of funding from the state going towards mental health services. Different areas of the state have slightly different amounts, and for the most part. They're within a thousand or so dollars of each other until you get to Eastern Connecticut, where I think they decided we only need three thousand dollars worth of funding compared to the others that are getting ten thousand. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that. We have just as many people out here that are in need of mental health services. I know a gentleman personally that's been suicidal back and forth for the past few years. He's manic depressive. He's fine half the time, but then the other half of the time he's bouncing off the walls and talking about killing himself. Um, so, yes, we have a need out here for mental health services. Yeah, we have more forests, but that doesn't mean everybody goes for a walk in the woods and gets better. Some of them go for a walk in the woods and kill themselves. Yeah. So, so per, per capita, we do get far less here, and we've um, that's been brought to our attention, we're all aware of it. We had a bill that would study that and look at that. For parity. It, it, for, for parity, it never went 
Yeah, I think it passed the House, but never never saw the Senate floor, so it didn't get anywhere. But the other thing... Why that, study it? We see it's different. Well, we do, but we need the administration to recognize that, and right now they're not. So we thought if it were evaluated and looked at, they would say, look, oh yeah, she's, they're right, uh, per capita, they're getting far less over here. Um, so we did, we did try to put that bill in, but it didn't go anywhere. But the other thing that many of you may not um, see the big flick is that you know, we, you know, we're half the state from the uh, east side of the river, we always say, from Route 9 River over here, but we have far less rep reps. So when you're up there and you're fighting for these things, we don't have as much representation. So it's very hard. It's much harder for us. We can put all of Eastern Connecticut together, every, you know, bipartisan effort, and we still don't equal what Bridgeport has. So you're looking so you're at... Looking at so, so they when, the when they want to make the deals and they want, uh, for example, if the governor wants to pass tolls mm -hmm. and he's looking around to see, okay, who do I need to win over and buy over, right? He doesn't need to buy us over because he has to do something for the whole half of the state. He can go to Bridgeport and get several reps, make a deal, say he'll give you a few million dollars for this, a few million for that, or whatever and he has the votes that he wants. So it, get, it gets difficult for us, but we have advocated for that. We've been at many meetings with United Services and others that have pointed that out to us, and we are working on it. It didn't get to the finish line this year, but hopefully we'll get it to the finish line. And, and the first step, honestly, is to have them evaluate it, because they've been crying for several years to, to um, up that budget and it just hasn't happened. So mm -hmm. they're, they, oh no, there's not a disparity, but there is a disparity and we know that. We know yeah. that. In addition to that, because um, the mental health, let's say the pool of money, mm -hmm. hasn't really changed. You're, you right. have the same people, You're, it would be a reallocation. Somebody is gonna lose funding from the pool that's been getting it to help us get more. So that's the other thing that you run into. So you have to figure <coughs> out. Maybe the other solution you, is we should just Bus our mentally ill people to Hartford, and they can get services there. <laughs> people think they do that and send everybody to London. I hear that all the time, too. Yeah. So, um, <coughs> you know, I mean, all we can do is, you know, we've been there, this is our third year, is to continue to advocate. I will tell you, they're I, starting I realize, to recognize that there, but. Um, Eastern Connecticut is alive and breathing, and that the people that they have in there now are very vocal and are well-respected, um, you know, to the point where we can stop an offshore windmill if we want to. Why would we want to? Well, we, I'm just using that as an example. There is a reason why we might want to. Um, but uh, Compared to the gas-fired fracking plant that didn't get stopped that. but it wanted to stop. Nothing to do with that. Uh, it's to do with the environment parts that were pulled out of the bill. And I'm saying, why were these environment parts pulled out of the bill? Well, that's strange. They were in there, and now they're pulled out. So, you know, there are things that if you talk about them on the floor, they're like, oh, God, she's talking about them on the floor. We're running out of time. You know, So mm -hmm. they will come, and you have this um, ability to um, have influence without having the numbers, I guess. I'll put it that way. You, know, you may not have the coalition and, and as many people as they do in Hartford or Bridgeport, but because you've worked with both sides, because you've been true to your word and you've helped people on their bills that make sense to you, and um, you're willing to have open conversations. When it comes up and there's something that you need, you're establishing now a reputation where you can um, be someone who is reasonable and when you're having a conversation about mental health in the future, they'll say, yeah, well, when I worked with you on this and what you said has been true so far, so really, let's have a serious conversation about this. And you know, we can't necessarily speak to who um, was in our positions before, but mental health is a huge, focus for me as chair of public health. I you know, received all kinds of awards last year for focusing on mental health. We passed, it took six years, I finally got a PTSD bill passed for mental health for police and fire and EMT, which is so critical. Um, our policemen actually can lose their jobs if they have a mental health issue. We were shipping them outside the state of Connecticut because of the stigma and they could perhaps lose their jobs so now they can seek the help they need within the state of Connecticut. And you know, that took so many years to do it. Um, and it was shocking to me on the Senate floor, um, one of the new senators who came in, which I did not know well at all, had been a police chief. And he, he stood up and he told the story with tears in his eyes on the first day that he uh, was on the, 
I guess the beat, they call it, he had to respond to a incident where a father had inadvertently run over his own child mm -hmm. in the driveway. And, you know, he described what it was like at the scene. Um, and then the next week it was a car accident. It was three weeks of horrible things. And he said to this day he wakes up 30 years later and he thinks of it. He, or if he sees something, it brings him right back because he was never allowed to get whatever the help is that he needed for that particular mm -hmm. incident. So um, we are making strides. Um, we have serious issues at our mental health facility in Middletown, Connecticut. Um, that's something that I've been working on daily, unfortunately, for three years, that we are starting to make progress, but it, we need a little more time. So I want you to know it's recognized and it's something that is very important to all of us here, and we're not going to stop until we have parity because it's unfair. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people with disabilities, I and mean, that's certainly something that's very uh, close to my heart. I think another great bill, a lot of bipartisan support, was on uh, uh, this uh, with dyslexia, making sure that um, the, 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 the teachers and people in the school system are properly trained to know how to interact with kids with uh, dyslexia. Uh, there was some um, there was some um, uh, some certifications that were put in place uh, a few years back. And with this, what this, uh, what this bill does as a commission is to um, assist the towns and assist the municipalities to make sure they get the assistance they need to get these, uh, get people certified, get in uh, education. What they say, knowledge is power. You know, they understand uh, some of the needs with dyslexia and um, also uh, uh, kids with autism uh, as they are transitioning into adulthood. Um, it, it extended the period of time that. Uh, they can get assistance in that transition period. They can start younger to learn how to uh, go into adulthood. Uh, we have a, uh, there's a, another a bill of the uh, kids with the spectrum uh, where people have that. There's a blue envelope. So if uh, somebody gets uh, pulled over, uh, they, have, they can have their, their registration in there and their license. And that cues a law enforcement officer right away uh, that the, uh, this person uh, suffers from that. And that allows the officer to, you know, um, act accordingly, so they can they can it, it allows the officer to give a much quicker assessment. In other words, so uh, I think uh, so. I think there's a, there's a lot of there was a lot of good uh, bills that way. I certainly on the, the uh, opioid crisis, um, it raised the penalty for fentanyl, which is uh, uh, fentanyl that's laced with our opioids is a, is a horrible horrible thing. Uh, it's a, a few little grains of salt, if you call it that. That's what it looks like. Is enough to kill somebody. Is absolutely lethal, and um, we need to hold the people accountable who are selling this in, uh, to our children, putting this poison into the youth of the flower of our uh, society, and uh, hold these people accountable. And uh, this bill did just that. Uh, overwhelming. I don't think there's anybody that voted against it in either party. It got signed into law. So it, these are steps in the right direction. Certainly, the mental health disparity. Um, I was uh, very. Uh, 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 encouraged by the bipartisan support that we got for that bill uh, in Eastern Connecticut, and uh, hopefully we can get that across the finish line next year. We'll keep fighting hard. Uh, everybody at this table fought very hard for that bill, and uh, we'll continue to make sure that, uh, particularly Northeastern Connecticut, has that mental health infrastructure in place. We get what we sh what we deserve. What we should be getting uh, working with the United Services, who does an amazing job with uh, very little money, doing providing amazing services. We need to get what we deserve here in Eastern Connecticut and also to work with law enforcement in the mental health community when uh, they respond to different uh, an opioid overdose or a mental health situation that they're properly trained. Uh, I, uh, I introduced a crisis bill. We're going to continue to work on that. That would uh, put mental health professional right in the law enforcement. Um, so we'd like to get that up here in the Plainfield area. So we'll continue to work on that and uh, try to move that forward. And uh, I think I think this mental health disparity uh, uh, commission that we want to put together, I think that will go a long way to making sure we, we get the uh, uh, we get what we need in this catchment zone for mental health uh, initiatives. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll keep fighting and keep moving, uh, and hopefully moving it forward. Uh. One thing about infrastructure, in our town, <coughs> I see we're going to have a need. It, and it only it came out because of better value closing. We have a man that is on a motorized chair yeah. and he pulls a wagon and he returns cans. Mike. Now, now, now that better value is closed, he has to go Lathrop Road under the highway, yeah. which has no sidewalk to Big Y, and he's taking up half the lane. So there's something you're gonna you're gonna have to think about because I think the state, 
right? To get to get sidewalk a sidewalk under that. Sidewalk responsibility. I've been through this. Oh really? Other towns. Sidewalks. Yeah, the bridge would have to be altered to fit the sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and sidewalks are the town's responsibility, even if it's a state road. They're starting mm -hmm. to change that now. Mm -hmm. But to give you an example, in Puckatuck, I have been trying for three years now, in any way I can, to try to get funding for a sidewalk that goes along a low-income disabled community that there are like disjointed sidewalks it's route one so there's no place to go you know the land pulls up and we've already had somebody killed on a motorized scooter with the flag he was run over we've had other people hit uh, there's just no place to get out of the road especially in the summer because route one is so busy it has not been funded um the, the dot in the state says i don't care if it's a state road when that road was built, Route 1, I think it was like a horse trail, you know, um, we weren't responsible for sidewalks. You can apply for these grants and, you know, you get the application in and you say, yep, we're going to get the grant, but then the grant isn't appropriated. They don't appropriate the grant. So it's not easy. We certainly can put in uh, grant for um, sidewalks along that corridor, we'd have to work with the town. Like you, you seem to think that the, the bridge would have to be expanded. I don't know whether it could Sorry, be done. It's five lanes under that bridge. There's not room for a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. So this bridge would have to be lengthened to get a sidewalk there. That's probably not going to happen. You'd have to move the, uh, well, the, move uh, the bridge. Uh, no. I mean, there's, um, so. But that's that's the, that's that's the, the downfall to yeah. it. You've got to figure out how, mm -hmm. it's unrealistic for the town to be able to afford to do that project. That's way too much. Sidewalks are expensive. But and to work together with the state. Absolutely. There's there's funding. You can it's apply for grants. It, again, sometimes it takes you three years before you get it. It's just because there's every town that's trying to get grants. Um, they um, What we did in Groton, if this is something that you could suggest to your um, select person, maybe whoever is newly elected, is we took an inventory of um, all of our roads and the conditions they were in, all the sidewalks, all the areas we needed sidewalks, and we had, we didn't do it, we had a professional do it, and we had a rating scale. They came up with a prioritized list of, you know, every road, every sidewalk that was needed, and we went out for a referendum and we bonded $17 million in the town of Groton, and over four years we fixed all of the roads and did all the sidewalks that we needed. Um, and then now it's coming to an end and they'd have to come back up and perhaps look at it again because people are now saying, look, my road is terrible, the sidewalks are there. Can't you go get state money to do, do the town road? I'm like, I, no, I can't. It's just, that doesn't happen. Um, but there's certainly grant opportunities to look at. The town can apply for what they call urban grants. Um, that has to come from the town. Once that is put in, then we can certainly push it um, it's good if you have a select person that you know calls the legislators and say, "Look, this is what we need." Then we know from the start we can push it. Um, there are steep grants; those are also those are maximum of five hundred thousand. So sidewalks cost way more than that, depending on how long it is. So there's different opportunities. Doesn't mean you're going to get it, but you got to get it in because if you don't ask, you can't be considered. But we can't put that in for for the town, though. Um, so and we also need to be aware. So, so we can push aware, it. We can kind of help mm -hmm. push it along. If we don't yeah. know, well, that's right. For you, this, right, you know, this is a good place to yeah. even bring it up. Right, but, but I think we can it's bring it up really, to the selectman's really office too. To do a road assessment, mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's anybody in here that does construction, but that was that was that worked so well in the town of Rotten. And when you brought it to the voters, um, they could see, okay, my road's going to get done, this sidewalk's going to get done, and they had an opportunity. They voted on it, and it was overwhelmingly supported. So. You know, they had a voice in the whole process. So, and you, you know, another thing I'd just like to touch on as well, uh, that's uh, <coughs> somewhat related. Uh, me and Ann attended the uh, policymakers uh, workshop a couple weekends ago. It's uh, people with different disabilities, and uh, it was actually a, a lady from uh, Plainfield that was part of a, a group that was uh, asking about uh, rural transportation needs, particularly with our those with disabilities, how to provide uh, rural transportation and. He had, uh, they had asked about uh, uh, forming a commission to actually look at ways to uh, uh, get, uh, you know, uh, provide that uh, transportation outlets to our uh, disabled populations. And uh, I think you, you mentioned the gentleman who's on uh, wheelchair bound, who, uh, you know, that would, that, who would probably fit into, uh, you know, that study. 
So that's something we, we need to look at. I know we uh, 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 Ann mentioned earlier before Heather uh, stepped in about the uh, uh, the bus routes. You know, getting the getting the bus line uh, uh, at least on a pilot basis uh, through a playing field, getting seat involved with NECOG. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to work on that as well. But I think uh, I think that study is uh, long overdue, at least to look at uh, ways to research rural transportation, particularly for the disabled populations. So. That's something we'll be, uh, uh, I'll be uh, looking forward to working with that group on. One of the things I think that we'd like to ask you is um, in these various meetings that we've had, um, and it's, it's complicated because Plainfield happens to be located right where one district ends and one district picks up. So unfortunately, we have 26 transit districts in the state of Connecticut. New York has one, by the way. So that means 26 district managers, and they have their own little entities. And you know, trying to get one to cross into another is not easy. So, and Plainfield has the luxury of like ending with seat and starting with Nicox. So, one of the things that we're hearing, and there's no way for us to verify this. So, if you can think about it, get back to us, ask your friends. Um, Plainfield being um, made up of four villages. We were told that if uh, the, a bus came down, it, could, it would not work to have them, let's say, make one stop or two stops in Mosa. That they would want to go to every individual's house to pick them up, like a school bus, which to me seems crazy. And then if they make another stop, you know, they want to do what they call a deviated route, which makes it more and more expensive. So instead of like coming into the village and making two stops where people would meet, meet mm -hmm. this is not if you're disabled. If you're disabled and you can't get out of your house, that's a different story. Um, they say that won't work, that they are better off going to individuals' houses and picking them up. That seems a little crazy to me. Who said that? How many stops do you have in your There's city? There's 42 stops. Your city, along with 12, how many stops do you have? Yeah, I don't know if the top that's of my head. That's through seat, so it's a, that's a different one. I don't know how many stops. But that's like a, a stretch of 12. That'd be basically the size of Musa. So, and I know there's at least two or three of them. But they said there would be 42 stops. Well, in, in the village, that's so I don't know. Yeah, and then not in Musa, but in all the four villages. Oh, the four villages. Um, which to me, it seemed more reasonable to have the bus come down. Granted, I am not a transit person, but and to make a few stops within each of the villages where people could go. When I, what we're being told is they can't get to even the stop, and my kid had to walk like pretty far to get to the bus stop. Um, so if you can ask around, if you think that is accurate please let us know if you think it seems unreasonable this isn't if you're you know disabled where they do make a stop if you're disabled if you know we have someone who's blind they clearly would stop at her house they would stop at somebody's house who's in a wheelchair um, but this would be just regular people to <coughs> us um, so if you can think about that and get back to us because we're not the experts and we have the experts telling us that because I said like a school bus you would be stopping and and they said yes so I know you weren't here when we were talking mm -hmm. earlier, but I think Kevin asked the question. We were talking about the amount of money that Plainfield, we, we believe, committed to it, which is the thirty to 33000 I know earlier on he, he was talking about he thought it was only twelve or fourteen because that was the prorated amount. Which should be the, 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 but that's what she put in the budget. Okay, right. so supposedly there's thirty to 33000 That would make about a $200,000 transit uh, program for this area so it would never accommodate all of the stops that Heather just described it would be far more expensive and your town would have to obligate more funds so we're talking about starting it with like a two hundred thousand dollar budget which would obligate um, Plainfield to about thirty thirty three thousand dollars roughly question. we haven't gotten yeah. a plan yet but. that's why I was asking a question where did that plan come with 42 stops mm -hmm. what happens is there like I said this is broken up into districts so the original plan and what we were originally told was that the buses from seat for example Plainfield does not belong to either transit district which makes it even more complicated mm -hmm. um, because they have to get approval to join these other trans by the other people so we were originally told by DOT because there's these routes going through Jewett City line number eight um, goes through and could just simply come up further at the big Y and turn around turned out 
seat didn't want to do that, they were going to charge $100,000 to do that because they said they needed a special bus. So that was off the table. So now seat is reconsidering or possibly reconsidering that to reroute this, which would have very little cost. But then you still have to have the ability for Plainfield and the select person to try to join in and let all the other mayors say it's okay to join in for this extra route. That has to happen. And then we were told if you can't get the people to the big Y, it doesn't do any good to bring the bus to the big Y. So to get people, and correct me if I'm explaining this wrong, to the big Y, the bus that comes down from up north, it would make sense that it would make the stops in the villages and pick them up right. and bring them to the big Y. So not being a transit person, I thought, and I believe Ann did, it would come down, it would make a couple stops in each village. Obviously, if you're disabled, it would stop at your house and then come down. What we're being told by the transit district up north is, no, that's not the way we do things. We actually make all these literally individual stops. And so my first thing was, well, do you get paid extra for all the stops or how does that work? You know, and what we're being told is people will not go to the designated spot to get the bus. I don't know if that's true or not true, but that's what we're being told by the data people, right? people that do the data. Which is different than what we proposed because correct. what we proposed is, at absolutely. certain routes and that was it. Right, so it's very you're different. absolutely correct. So when we met initially, it was about a pilot program right. and the cost was about the $200,000 and we were talking about getting it started and then finding out what ridership was. NECOG went and did their surveys that they were asked to do, so they did do them, but they implemented this massive plan, massive plan that we had never discussed and, um, and then DOT was surprised. And so now so. we're kind of back <laughs> now to... Now we're back to where we are. Trying to kind of come to some kind of uh, conclusion as to what how we can get this done. So DOT again told us, and we've been told this before, they were confident that they could make this work. But we were told that last fall, and here we are today without anything implemented. In fact, we were told, I think, in, in July or August that it would be up and running by November. Right. So we were kind of... Right, so I think where we are now is DOT understands what a priority it is. They understand and they recognize that Plainfield is uh, an old mill town that's sort of cut off from access, which they don't like. But the good news is with a new commissioner, we have uh, new things that they're doing that they haven't done before. For example, instead of having to have a transit district go out and buy this $100,000 bus, they can use like a Ford van, as long as you could put down a um, like a, a ramp so you could get a wheelchair up. So they're they're thinking outside the box. If you don't have a handicapped person on the route and you only have five people, they actually will give you a diesel Jetta so that you can use that to pick people up and you get better gas mileage because the buses they use get seven miles to the gallon. So they're starting to think outside the box, which is encouraging. They're also interested in really looking to help move those who are handicapped or disabled around in a different way. For medical appointments, for this, that, and the other thing. Well, they have we the dial-a-ride for that. I'm sorry? They have the dial-a-ride for that. The problem with the dial-a-ride is the fact that you schedule an appointment, and then a day later they call and say, I'm sorry, we have to reroute it. Mm -hmm. That person who's scheduled to go to a doctor's appointment mm -hmm. doesn't get there. Right. That's why they're looking at things differently. We have a system through DSS called VAO, which is failing miserably. Oh, don't go to VAO. Right. No, Please. no, that's why they're we looking to possibly take over some of the things that VAO's doing because it's not working. So that's the good news is that they are being creative. Um, again, the the difficulty or the obstacle to overcome is um, two ingrained transit districts that are on some level not necessarily competing but competing they are and they're sort of set in the way that they do things so um, we have to be able to manage that conversation and say okay no you know this is what we want we want two stops we want this we're not going to be able to do everything as we have because the funds aren't there okay so education they're pushing education to try to do merging if possible mm -hmm. And that's that's the that we're hearing is that you they're mean the a, a joint venture with, with different uh, uh, school systems. That's what they're pushing for. Why can't they do the same thing with the uh, Cogs? With Cogs, 
Yeah. So they tried that. Yeah. Um, I know I they all want to hold on to their own little territory, but if they want more funding, shouldn't they be doing encouragement like they do the school systems? You know, I think they, well, actually they tried to do that, but what happened is, you know, like the Southeastern COG is pretty tight, it's well run, it's this, that, and the other thing, and they're happy to have the Northeast join, but they don't want to be split up themselves because the lines were drawn by the state, just like the health districts were. Mm -hmm. That was the issue. I think if you encourage them to um, empower themselves to do it, it would be different, but the state carved it up and said, this will be this COG, this will be this COG, rather than allowing the COGS themselves to do it. Um, and we put in a bill to try to break up the transit districts. I'm like, I think they should all be competitively bid. You shouldn't have a monopoly in each different yes. district. Mm -hmm. yes. And that bill went nowhere. <laughs> but it's, you know, because in other states, like New York is one transit mm -hmm. director. We've got 26. So, and you know, this one doesn't want to cross this line and you know, it becomes a little kingdom, you know? like New England towns. So, um, but I think we could, you know, if, if we didn't have this arbitrary line, you could have had MECOG and SEEK and whoever all competing for the business here and whoever came up with the best plan and could service the area, that would be great. But we don't have that now. So um, I can tell you that it's a focus and that um, DOT, we, we're gonna meet with them in three weeks and see what they've come up with. So. And the other thing is you have no authority to tell seed for this one, you have to do this. You have to encourage them to want to do it. And then Plainfield has to try to join each one. Um, so there are, you know, they meet once a month. So mm -hmm. it's, but it's a process. Would it help if citizens wrote to these individuals? You know, I think it would help when we, let's say that we find out, and I'm going to be positive, that SEAT is actually going to say, yeah, we can do this. And they give us what the, the fee would be to, to go up the 10 miles to Big Y. And then we have to go in front of the Southeastern COG and say, this is something Plainfield. Then it would be really helpful to have citizens come to the meeting and say, yeah, we really could use this. I just went to a COG meeting a few weeks ago on the sidewalks in Pocketuck because there was extra money left over and I was trying to get it designated to Pocketuck versus someone else and the COG voted no, it's going to go to Norwich. But I was, we were able to at least have the conversation and if people from Pocketuck had shown up, that would have helped. So yes, we will definitely let you know because, you know, having citizens participate. actually participate and advocate makes a big difference, you know, so. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, I'm a blue I live accordingly, but uh, my own business in Thailand, thank you for 15 years in Garden. So I saw that um, the earlier, you know, say I have a couple, you know, suggestions. They say that why you don't think about it, Uber, you know, why you don't think about mm -hmm. it, you know, say get a credit to the um, uh, some taxi to do the, you know, the handicap because in Hong Kong they, they, mm -hmm. they do the, you know, taxi mm -hmm. with the handicap van. So that's a you know credit back, mm -hmm. and also we say that um, uh, most is a culture different. So I take care of my parent. So mm -hmm. if you have a, you know the family member who bets uh, better than you know your own family member to take care of your handicap or disabled parent, right? So mm -hmm. that is a you know credit. You know, gotta think about in a tax credit mm -hmm. or future example. You know, so to can benefit both. So state probably you know they cut a big chunk of uh, you know say budget from there to you. If you think about it, you know, the other bus, all the hundred thousand dollars from uh, I have an office in my I'm a I'm a real estate broker, you know, so I have a no, I'm a knowledge office. So from knowledge to you, you know, say um uh, Lisbon, Lisbon go to Painfield, they're all fifteen, fifteen minutes. So how many how many um uh, you know passenger on the road? Not too many. Right. So if a hundred thousand dollars if you cut it you know by a trunk and say that to study side, you know, say a Uber or um uh, you know the um a private sector. Mm -hmm. Say if you do that, you know, say we can, you know, get you the credit back. So that's a market in you know, expense. Right. But yeah, I'm not going to this, and I, I'm also a security the EDC, you know, the um, uh, right chair. I talk about it, you know, say, how is the you know economic growth in our northeast quiet corner? Mm -hmm. So including you know Penfield, killing me all the way up. So I host you know the four and you know, the thank you and you know they stop by one attend the one meeting. So we talk about it, say. 395 is a um, uh, you know the empire um, 
Is it the empire, you know, call door, you know, the task credit, is it disappear? Is it true? So it's not enterprise. Is that, Your enterprise zone? Yeah. Enterprise zone 395 actually phase out. It hasn't been phased out here? It's in a couple of years, it'll be gone. Yeah. Yes. So what what is the benefit to come to, you know, the northeast? So that's it. You that's need an enterprise zone. No, we need a credit. You, know, you need we, a credit. We already have an enterprise zone. I thought you said it was phasing out, though. It will be. Mm -hmm. Because you know, say otherwise, if you look any benefit to the um, uh, well, have you been you're not recognized as an opportunity zone either. Yes, but you know, say not every single time is an opportunity zone. Right. Panama is. Mm -hmm. Norway is. Yeah, the governor chose those. Mm -hmm. The last governor. Yep. He, he gave the uh, governors the authority to designate opportunity yeah. zones. Only seven or and how many in Connecticut? There's one in Groton, and they he. He cut it off at like the wrong spot, so like there's like a demarcation line that yeah. needs real work, and and they're not included in the opportunity zone. So I have looked at what do we have to do to get new opportunity zones? How do we change them or modify them? And it has to be done at the federal level. So that's something that I'm trying to work on with Joe Courtney's office because that decision was made, providing an opportunity for those families to have what they call respite, so that. If the family needs a break for two weeks, they can put that adult child or person into a respite situation so that they can have a break. Some families that I've talked to have not had any kind of respite in like 10 years, even a weekend. So you can't continue that. Um, but so they are starting to do that. But I like your idea of the tax credit. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Because that, that mm -hmm. happened in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. That's an, uh, yeah. Asian, Asian I thought if you're like the son, you're supposed to take care of yeah. your family, yeah. right? Also, right? That's cultural, <laughs> right? We grew up together. Mm -hmm. They have the same house in the three hundred mm -hmm. square feet in the family of four. Mm -hmm. So you got not much choice in that. Right. So when you grow up, now I say get older. My house is you know the ten times bigger. And right. Then I say only two. My wife and I use in my mom bed, and they say, hey, we take care of my mom. Right. Yeah. But right. My, my point is say because of, you know the um. Uh, we always look into the nonprofit or uh, you know, say out there mm -hmm. to take care, you know, that you know, say citizen. Right. But uh, what about the family? Mm -hmm. Never promote it and say that when your kid grow up from the high school, college, come home. Mm -hmm. Always say, you know, they in Chinese say, you know, say, if your parents still alive, you don't go far away. But uh, that's a change in the heart. Mm -hmm. You know, change mm -hmm. in the heart. You don't go far away. You want to close to your family. Mm -hmm. So that is, um, you know, say, all the culture at the, in the past. Now it's totally different. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, say, Hong Kong is a small, small right. place, you know, so. Well, I will say a lot of the, including my own older children, they would love to be here, but they they, they don't have the opportunity here that they have in a city. You know, we, my we, kids we, went we, to we York and LA, now they're in Nashville. We talk so. about that a lot about that, not opportunity here. Mm -hmm. What does opportunity mean to you? Right. Opportunity for them, for a millennial, yeah. means they want a thriving city that's walkable, that yes. there's young people, it's fun to go out, it's not super yes. expensive, they can work um, in something that they love or they like. Uh, but it's, it's more of the opportunity of being able to um, walk to work, to be able to go out yeah. in a walking environment, um, to be able to not have the only the choice of electric boat or Sikorsky or whatever. Yeah. They want multiple opportunities. And what I found, I just came back from Nashville visiting them. Nashville is awesome. There's yeah. so many young people. People are friendly. The city. So you tell the answer you old here, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, taxes are low. Um, so it is hilly with but the city's beautiful it's clean there's trees i can see why people would want to live there and we got to do that here we have to figure out a way to make our city thrive i mean i was in london is the city of undisputed potential it has waterfront it can't get out of its own way it can be gorgeous but i have people that won't even go across the bridge you know so we have to sort of change that dynamic Senator, remember, you let them have our own police force. Killing me don't have our own police force. Thank you have our own police force. That's a make it a lot of different, you know, say the budget wise. So we always talk about the dollar and cents and budget. But you know, say in here, I try to promote it as an economic world. How the state can promote it, you know, say 
our you know quiet corner, you know, say how we can make it you know say attractive to the new younger generation to stay yeah, here to stay and have a better place. job, better pay. Mm -hmm. So not overnight, but that at least it can be done. Yeah. Maybe a little more opportunity. We, 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 we really always say, people you know, people move in because it's cheaper, he does, he's a you know, housing. Mm -hmm. okay. That's fact, yes. That's true. Yeah, but you know, why does that we can provide a higher quality? I was a, mm -hmm. the gentleman sitting on the health department for a while, you know, mm -hmm. I was a represent the time you lady for many years. <laughs> yeah, so we always have promote in a healthy community. I think we have an opportunity you know, for, so. um, you know, this is a, it's an area that has, um, you know, it's beauty, it's more rural, it yes. has state parks, has character. it has character. Um, I'm meeting with the tourism districts shortly, like I have a week with, I have a meeting with the um, DCD commissioner, hopefully next week to talk about how do we market the green belt and everything that's yeah. around it there's here. There's a lot of green value here, mm -hmm. so that's all um, about. But I think this is a more difficult sell for the, for the younger generation, only in the fact that the many of the ones that I've talked to in multiple, they want to be able to have like a thriving downtown. Mm -hmm. So we have to start, I think we got to fix Main Street and then we can, if we get Main Street up and running, we get, um, you know, more small businesses there. We get like this collective, almost like the old European model where there's this, yeah. you know, Main Street, you can walk and then you can go from there. I think that will start to bring people back. But our problem is, mm -hmm. The policies that we're putting in in Hartford are hurting the small business person and we're not listening to them and we have small businesses that have they write you letters they send you emails they can't come up and testify because they're the ones that are working so you have legislators that have never had a small business they've never actually worked outside of government and they're saying well, where are they how come they're not here because they're working they don't have somebody to fill their spot you know, they're the owner, they're doing all the jobs. Maybe a few can come up, but it's not like you're gonna get this overwhelming crowd. I've got a guy in Mystic who is literally in tears. He's on the cover of Yankee Magazine as New England's best this summer, Mystic Knotworks. He's got a business where he actually um, lets pretty much single moms go home and they do piecework and they hand make these, um, whether it's a keychain or a doormat out of hemp, I think it is rope mm -hmm. and there yeah. is it hemp I don't know yeah. it's, it's beautiful it's and he's got a great shop it's artisan he has stuff online he's like you are killing me between your increase in your minimum wage That's and your paid wage. family leave yep. I can't do it and he's like I don't even know what's wrong with the legislature they're not listening to me I'm a small business I'm giving you know single mothers an opportunity to do what they can piecework I'll pay them by piecework and um, giving them an opportunity to be able to be home and do and, and you're not listening and i've heard that overwhelmingly mm -hmm. from businesses in Pawkatuck around this they're like i'm done i'm out of here before so, yeah. this legislature voted for paid family leave we got a letter from bigelow t who has been here for 150 years and they made it very clear if you do this we're done we did it they're done you know and they're out in fairfield so there are this other ways to do the things that they're yeah, trying to do in the legislature, yeah. Yeah. but they want to make us all dependent. They would rather yeah. just pass something that's lousy than have a conversation about how to make like what they want to do better. Yeah. And paid family leave is a perfect yeah. example. Yeah. Paid family leave. I don't know if you've talked about it, but I get really agitated with this because everybody can agree paid family leave sounds like a great idea. I would have loved to have that when I had a child. I would like to have that if my parents are sick. But it's a mandatory payroll deduction out of every single working person's income, except state employees and municipal employees. Okay, and you can take now, twelve that, weeks a year. How does that work for employers that already allow paid medical? Expenses? Doesn't matter. Still coming out. Twelve weeks a year. But everybody, the federal law requires that every employer allows unpaid time off. Right, but this is, this is a paid time off. So right. um, the, the Connecticut insurance had to be given permission to implement family medical leave. So, so there hasn't been any paid family medical leave in the state. There hasn't been any programs for that. They implemented that. And that was what the private um, option that we provided was, is to 
give the insurance permission to implement that and do it um, privately versus statewide. So the plan that passed, so it's everyone, you can get a paycheck, you're gonna, whether you have a year to retire or not, you're gonna get a deduction out of it. And the deduction is not a lot, but that's not the point. The point is it's gonna cost the state close to $100 million just to start up plan because they don't have the software or the capability to implement so it. Blow so that it's one too. $80 million to just get the software up and running. And another like $20 million a year for the licensing of the software every year. They don't talk about that. They want 140 Department of Labor new employees to administer the plan for them. Of course. It takes about 49 people Jobs for Democrats. to contribute to pay for one person's leave. So it's financially broke before it starts. The only way the system works is if you don't take the leave. They're betting on you not taking the leave. So to me, that's a terrible plan. You're, you're, you're being deceitful to the citizens by saying we're gonna implement this program for you, hoping they're not gonna use it. So, and I, it's, it's tiresome listening to people say, well, Massachusetts has it, you know, uh, New Jersey has it, New York has it. All those states have something completely different. They have a statewide disability plan, which Connecticut doesn't have. So what they did is they put a rider on their statewide disability plan so people could have access to paid family leave through that rider. Their plans are also not nearly as luxurious as ours. Ours says family member, spouse, child, grandparent, or anyone you consider like family to take the leave. So I'll let you decide who that is. To me, that's my dog. So um, we decided, let's, we, we agree that people should have access to paid family leave. It's noble, it's something that I wish I had, and I'm sure everybody else wishes they had it. But let's let the power and the decision be made on the individual basis, because I think people are better at making the decision than government is. So we contacted the other states and we said, if we take down the wall, will you allow Connecticut to tag in to your disability rider for paid family leave? And guess what? It's underwritten by a Connecticut company, the Hartford Insurance Company. Okay, so we're helping a Connecticut business. So yes was the answer. So what we did is we said, let's go to the insurance. Our bill was, let the, as Ann said, let the insurance commissioner allow this to happen. Completely shut down. Is it because it's a difference between because it's a different idea mm -hmm. it's the private sector which you have the, but the thing about the private sector is you have the choice as an individual i could have chosen mm -hmm. i want to have two weeks paid family leave or i want to have 10 or i want to have 12 and this is the percentage i want covered and this is what i'm willing to pay plus it's probably cheaper because you have a larger pool mm -hmm. of three states paying into it so that was our plan. We came up with a plan, and it was met on deaf ears. And um, so now pl employers are trying are saying, "Oh my God, mm -hmm. what no one talked about as a small business, your head's going to explode." So if you have an employee who takes paid family leave for 12 weeks, they're out, and you have a temporary person filling their spot. Let's say you're on a manufacturing floor, you have to fill that position. You have to give the employee their exact position when they come back, which we can all agree to. But the person that you've filled it with, if you let them go, you are now paying their unemployment. Mm -hmm. yep. So everyone's mm -hmm. unemployment rate is going to go sky high mm -hmm. as a small business. And with the state of Connecticut, you cannot argue with unemployment. You right. buy it. And the no unemployment have... fund is already broke, so you're going to be getting a new assessment, which is going to be your wow. share of what's broke. So I'm those are the for temporary. Yeah, it just like, gets worse. I guess you could do that, but you know, in certain circumstances, like we were talking to, I'll throw this out, doctors' offices where they have medical assistance, and one of the doctors that we were working with says, "I don't know what it is, but they all get pregnant at the same time." <laughs> so I can't imagine what happens if I have you know ten medical assistants mm -hmm. and they're all out on family leave and I have to replace them with temporary help, it doesn't matter, I'm still paying that unemployment. We tried to get that changed in an amendment saying, you know, the employer should not be held because of, like paid family <coughs> leave should not count towards like increasing unemployment um, and that fell on deaf ears. So that's something I, I think we need to bring up again. Um, the other thing that um, distinguishes us from all the other states and uh, uh, Senator Summers mentioned, it's a luxurious plan. 
is if the payback on it is up to 95% of your of your pay, up to $1,000 a week. So it's you're actually incentivizing wow. employees to take that. I mean, how, what other plan gets 95% return, right? Most of them are between 60 and 80, not 95%. So the idea that we're kind of incentivizing people to use it is going to you know so we believe that it out of the gate it was already unfunded we believe that and very quickly the, the cost of it is one of three things is going to happen we believe that the employer it, the employee is going to pay a lot more than just the 0.05 percent now um, the employer may have to match it or the um, I forgot what the third one was but there were or it, it's just going to be unsustainable thank you it's going to be bankrupt, yeah. It's going to be bankrupt. He's talking about the years that we need to move out. Sorry. <laughs> you know, just real quick, yeah. just to uh, follow up on what Heather and uh, Ann said, like the the replacement workers. You know, somebody's a machinist in a manufacturing environment, right? It, it takes years of training to perfect those skills. Now that person goes out. There's no way. You can, uh, I don't think you have somebody with those type of skills just around every corner yeah. waiting to come in. It's very it's very specialized, narrow type of uh, skills in most cases. Um, when that person goes out, that work's not getting done. Right. So now if you, you, you got orders that you have to fill and you're unable to fill them, whoever that, uh, the, uh, the end uh, order goes to, another company, another business, whatever, they're gonna cancel those orders. Guess what's gonna happen to business in the manufacturing sector in Connecticut? It's even gonna be worse than what it is right now. Well, we have to wrap it up because we only have the room until yes. seven, so we're overstayed by a half an hour. Um, if you want to take one of these sheets, I just want to let you know that because my face is on here, it does not mean that I supported all these bills in any way. It means that this is what passed, just so you know. I, I don't want anyone to think that I supported some of these things in here because I did not. Um, but you can take a look at um, what passed. It gives you an idea of some of the legislative... Um, <laughs> good things, bad things, and things to be, yet be determined. Um, so I just would like everyone to know if you have any questions, you can always email us or um, call us. We'll get back to you. We will get back to the gentleman about the earned income tax credit. I was texted that nothing has changed, but that does not mean that I don't have the total number of what has been spent. Um, and if you have any ideas, if you want to be included on the transit, um, if when we get to the point where we're going to be advocating in front of different groups that have to agree, please let us know and we'll make sure that you're included and you can attend the meetings. So I thank you for coming. I know it's a very hot early summer evening thank and you. have a great 4th of July. Thank you all. And we will talk soon. Thanks.